the data. Understanding the rehab covert ops involvement builds a bridge for inclusion of the ET abduction subject in any disclosure discussion. A partial disclosure is no disclosure at all. All you would have then is a repackaged, new and improved cover up. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. We'll be fine. All right. Here's this. Thank you so much. Here's this if you want to see Ty. Okay. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Niara, one of my case examples yeah. <laughs> here for military on military and her incredible recovery story. You know, here I know I talked a lot about things that are pretty scary, pretty traumatic. But this is someone who has overcome the trauma of her experiences. She's going to share her healing journey with you um, and her experiences as well. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Her incredible testimony as an insider, as a, as a, as a whistleblower coming out. So thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you. Well, thank you very much for your attention. I'm not sure if I want to be confined behind this podium. Um, I really appreciate all of you coming out to hear me. Um, this is kind of a big deal for me to come out uh, publicly with this story. There's an awful lot of things to say that um, are real uncomfortable for me to say to you. Oops. Uh, for me to say to you, and also probably are going to be uncomfortable for you to hear. Um, but I consider them to be uh, what I call evolutionary pressure. Um, they certainly put pressure on me to evolve and to expand and to really, really go beyond myself to understand what exactly was going on. So um, the, I'm talking about from experiencing trauma to moving beyond fear. And let's get to the next here. Um, this is my chronology. Um, I served from April of 1979 to 83. I was honorably discharged. Um, I married uh, for the second time while I was in the Air Force and stayed home as a wife and mom for a year. In uh, 1984, I was employed by EG&G Special Projects um, in their technical resources uh, facility. Um, I'm sure you recognize that company name from many ET documentaries. Um, I divorced in 1985, was laid off from EG&G in 1987. I attended University of Nevada, Las Vegas for a time. In 1993, I did a legal name change from Janet to Niara. So you'll notice some of my documentation has Janet on it. Um, that was kind of a spiritual decision for me. Um, and in... Uh, it just seemed like uh, government contract work after I got out of the military just seemed to go from one to the next to the next. So I was employed by Computer Sci Sciences Corporation and by, then by Science Applications Corpor International Corporation, SEIC, another one that figures uh, fairly prominently in UFO documentaries. And both uh, EG&G and SEIC employ a lot of ex-military personnel. There's my honorable discharge certificate, uh, just to let you know that that's me. Um, so after I got out of the military, um, I started to get what I call internal tremors. Um, I started experiencing very, very alarming heart palpitations. Um, my heart would take off at a mad gallop, and it would feel like somebody was choking me at the same time. Um, very, very unpleasant. I went to a doctor for it for a while. Um, I didn't end up on medication. I decided to do yogic breathing to calm it down, and by some concentrated effort with that, that worked. Um, I had anxiety and episodic depression. Um, it was uh, really hard. Um, of course, bad marriages didn't help, but um, when I I actually thought about ending my life, and I was in a really good relationship at that time, so kind of go figure, you know. Um, I had someone who was like a best friend as well as a relationship partner. Um, but I just got to the point where the angst was so bad that I um, couldn't hardly deal with life anymore. Um, but the other thing that's really important to know about me is that I've always been a spiritual person from the cradle up. 
Um, I was one of those kids that while I did play with toys, as soon as I could read, I was at the library checking out books on all the sciences, uh, history, biographies. I really wanted to really know and understand the world that I lived in. It was very, very important to me. So that was my favorite activity, was being at the library, learning about the world I lived in and what my relationship to it and the larger universe might be. I, was, I went to church for a while, and that was like a dead end <laughs> for me. Um, I just, you know, I needed to find out everything I could about the world around me. Um, so when I came up to the suicide, um, I had done a number of readings about near-death experiences, um, notably Raymond Moody's book, Life After Life. Um, and so then some of my own exper spiritual experiences up to that time pointed out to me that if I actually did kill myself, um, I wasn't going to be dead. My body would be dead, but I would be someplace. And when I started thinking it through from that standpoint, I decided that it was not a way out at all. It was probably a way to make everything worse. And not the least to be considered was I had two children at the time who uh, would have been really devastated uh, had I done that. So that was also a factor. So faced with not being able to go on living the way I had been and not really being able to com commit suicide either, <laughs> I made what I call a 500% whole body commitment to healing and where, whatever it took, whatever I had to face. And I really believe that it was that level of commitment that began to set up the time, places, people, situations that guided me through my healing process. So um, that was a, a very significant time for me uh, to back away from the suicide and to make that full commitment to my healing. Um, it's probably worth interjecting here, too, that um, many people that I've talked to about my childhood said, oh, you were an early indigo. You were an early indigo child. And then I listened to Dolores Cannon the other night, and uh, definitely I'm a first waiver. Uh, so that's, uh, that's been very clear to me as I've progressed through my healing process, that there, there is something there to that. Um, 1989, we had George Knapp on KLAS-TV um, doing his uh, nightly series on UFOs, the best evidence. And I was ab absolutely glued to the TV for every single segment. I still have it on a VHS tape, because I taped every single one. And uh, I was sitting on the sofa, and my nails dug into the cushion. I was just like, you know, and it was, it was, a lot of it was very triggering for me. Um, I know now, because I'm a certified body-centered life coach, that that's called a body flag. The heart palpitations, that's a body flag. That's an indicator of material going on under the surface that's causing upset. You know, to have that reaction to a TV show, that's a body flag that is some indicator of an un underlying upset. Um, so these were things that I learned later on. Um, discovering missing time. Um, I had a good friend of mine uh, named Dirk, and uh, we were talking about all kinds of things, UFOs and spirituality and all kinds of things. We had these great conversations, and he noticed that whenever I talked about my military time, I kind of got really vague and just kind of glossed over it and went on to another subject. And he thought, well, that's really odd, because she's so bright and so uh, articulate about every other thing we discuss. Um, he, he wanted to know more about that. So he sat me down one afternoon, and he says, I want you to tell me about your military time from beginning to end. Just go through it chronologically. So we did, and we went through these different levels, entered the military in Cleveland, Ohio, boot camp for six weeks at Lackland Air Force Base. I remembered quite well that I was in the 3903rd Squadron Unit. Um, I attended technical training at Keesler Air Force Base in Mississippi. Um, after that was completed, I went to, uh, back to Ohio to spend Thanksgiving and Christmas with my family and my, my little girl. She was four years old at the time. And uh, then we, uh, my daughter and I traveled out to Nellis Air Force Base, which was my first duty station. Uh, after technical training school. 
And then we got out there. Um, I got a roommate. Um, and she was the one that was going to take care of my daughter for me when, when I went up to Tonopah every week because the rotation was for 554th range group was you would go up to the test site for a week and you'd stay at a motel, you'd be billeted at a motel up there in Tonopah and then uh, every morning they'd take you out to the test site, you'd do your work on the range and then you'd come home. Um, when I got to that part of my memories, I remembered what I just told you and I remembered that I worked there, but I didn't remember any details whatsoever. No details whatsoever. I remembered nothing about the people I worked with. I remembered nothing about the compound, nothing about the radar site itself. I didn't remember anything. I had to work very, very hard to retrieve even the tiniest detail of memory about that experience. And uh, with the discovery of that missing time came another body flag, a huge wave of nausea. I didn't actually throw up, but I did feel very sick to my stomach when I realized that there was about three months of my life I couldn't remember any detail from whatsoever. So in 1994, uh, I attended the Whole Life Expo in Las Vegas, Nevada, and Bud Hopkins was one of the speakers there, so I attended his lecture. And at the question and answer part, I raised my hand. I said, OK, well, I have this strange dream from childhood about being left alone under a street lamp. And I have missing time from the Air Force, three months. And then I have this other weird dream that I had with a dark figure that was in my room when I woke up from the dream. You know, just a lot of experiences that uh, had been plaguing me up to that point. And he pointed to me and he said, speak to me afterwards. So I did that, and I told him a few of the, the things that were going on for me and uh, how concerned I was, especially about the missing time from the Air Force. And he asked if I'd like to do a session with him that evening, and I said, yes, I would. I really need some answers about this. So we did a session, and my life changed forever that night. Um, pretty much turned my life inside out. Um, I did discover that alien abductions had started for me in childhood, and uh, we recovered at least some of the missing time from the three months in question from the Air Force, and it was really, really uh, very, very traumatic. It was very, very terrifying. Um, I had a headache that began during the hypnosis session. And it persisted despite all of his attempts to try to cause it to go away with a suggestion. And it persisted for three days afterwards. And incidentally, talk about commitment, setting up the time, places, and situations for your healing process to emerge, even though it may not be easy for you. Um, I was actually working back out at the Nevada test site at that time. I was working uh, for SAIC when all this started coming to light. And, uh, more to that. Right now, um, I'm going to show you a little video clip because way back in 1995, um, I was in a documentary called Dreamland by Bruce Burgess. It aired on TV in 1996. And I did a little segment in that in shadow. I did not want my identity to be divulged. Um, and now I'm going to run that clip for you now. You guys gonna start that up for me? This is the Nellis Air Force Base, one of the top military installations in America. It's split into four main areas the Tonopah and Nevada test sites where America's top secret nuclear tests take place, as well as the Nellis bombing range, where the latest jets and bombers are put through their paces. It's also home to Area 51, so if there are flying saucers being tested over the desert, then the personnel at Nellis definitely know about it. We were contacted by a former radar operator at Nellis, who confirmed that she had witnessed a classified flying disc test 
out in the test range. She left the Air Force in 1985 and is...